Hello. We're going to continue the series of spectral analysis applied to pianos. This will be part two. And I'm going to spend it on looking into the precursors that I talked about in part one. I'm going to preface it with a few comments on some of the feedback from part one. Okay, uh, one, uh, there was some feedback about the origin of these spurious spectral components, and one person suggested they might come from interactions between the unisons. So I took a look at C2 sharp. Uh, it's a three string key, and I struck it, all three strings. Then I used mutes and struck just a single C2 sharp string and looked at the spectrum and plotted them with an offset so you could compare them. The blue is the three string and the black is the middle string spectrum and it's uh, plotted in, in linear units instead of decibels like I did in part one. And you can see that the spectra are pretty much the same. And out here in this area where we have this so-called strange or spurious components, uh, it occurs in the three string strike, but it also occurs in the, the individual string. So it's probably not a consequence of interaction between the unisons. Another comment related to the inharmonicity of C8, I posted this graph in, in part one and made the comment that there was inharmonicity at the fundamental, which is stupid. It isn't, that isn't the case at all. Uh, take a look at this. Here's the harmonic in red. Here's the partial, and it's tuned a little bit sharp of the harmonic. That's all. You can't make any comments about inharmonicity unless you talk about how the partials are spaced and relative to the harmonics. And here, the second harmonics, or second partials, are really kind of poorly defined. I'm not sure whether it's this peak or that peak. So there isn't much you can say about inharmonicity for this particular key. So I'm going to have to concede that point completely. Now let's take a look at the precursors. We'll start with uh, the overall view of an A4 wave. This is from my Kanabi, plotting the amplitude versus time. Here's the beginning of the wave over here. And we'll take a look at the beginning. And you can see that indeed there is a something going on before the bulk of the wave comes through, which is this stuff right here. But there appears to be two parts. There's uh, this part here, which is a got some vibration going on or some periodicity, but it's a low frequency. And then there's a little spot right here of high frequency stuff that occurs just before the bulk of the wave shows up, which in fact is the transverse component. So let's take a slight side trip here and try to get a handle on when those things, when those various precursors show up by taking a look at some of the equations. And I apologize for doing this because I like to keep these presentations non-mathematical, but unfortunately we can't, we can't avoid it here. I want to start by looking at the relationships between the string tension, string density, cross-sectional area of the string, string length, transverse wave speed. In other words, how fast does the transverse wave component move along the string after the hammer strikes the string. Same thing for the longitudinal component, CL, and the fundamental frequency and the period. Okay, here's the, the, fun, here's the basic equation. The fundamental frequency is equal to something that says it depends on the tension inversely on the density, inversely on the cross-sectional area, and inversely on the length. This is a widely used equation and it comes from solving the wave equation. It's actually an eigenvalue result. 
And you could also manipulate this equation to solve for t as a function of the fundamental frequency, the tension. So I'm going to use that later. Down here, for example, here's the cross-sectional area. Here's the expression for the transverse wave speed. It depends on the tension and on the density and the cross-sectional area. The longitudinal wave speed depends on the density, but it also depends on the Young's modulus, which is a measure of the elasticity. Now here's some typical values for A4, which has a fundamental of 440 hertz. Its period, which is the reciprocal of the frequency, would be 2.27 milliseconds. The length between where the string is struck and the bridge, uh, yeah, the bridge, I'm calling L wiggle. It's a little bit longer, a little bit shorter than the actual speaking length because the string is struck at about one-eighth of its length. And in this particular case for the A4 key, it's about 3.5 meters. The speed of the transverse component from this equation right here is 313 meters per second. The longitudinal speed is 5,032. So we've got a longitudinal component moving order of magnitude quicker than the transverse component. Now let's relate some of the times. Uh, the time of the transverse component arrival will be equal to the time of the hammer strike plus the time it takes to go from the hammer strike spot to the bridge, which will be equal to that distance, which is the distance from the hammer strike to the bridge, L wiggle, divided by the speed of the transverse component, which we have already seen is around 300 meters per second. Now you can turn that equation around and you can solve for TH where the hammer strikes, the time of the hammer strike. So you just take this, solve for a, th here from this equation, and you'll get this. You can also calculate the time that the longitudinal component arrives by saying it's equal to the time when the hammer strikes the string plus the time it takes for the longitudinal component to reach the bridge, and that will be the distance from the hammer strike to the bridge divided by the speed of the longitudinal component. So we can back calculate time of the hammer time strike, the hammer strike time, the longitudinal arrival, if we pick off the arrival of this transverse component, which we'll be able to do. So here are typical values. Uh, the transverse time arrives about 1.1 milliseconds before the hammer strikes, or after, I'm sorry, after the hammer strikes. The longitudinal arrives about 70 microseconds after the hammer strike. So we have two numbers here, 70 microseconds for, for the arrival of the longitudinal component, 1.1 millisecond for the arrival of the transverse component. Now keep in mind, these numbers are approximate. That's why I've got the red, bold, italic thing going here for approximately. Now, from my A4 key that I showed you earlier, I'm going to do the following. I'm going to measure the string length from the hammer strike spot to the bridge, and get L wiggle. I'm going to measure the diameter of the string using micrometer. I'm going to go to that curve that I showed you before, this one. I'm going to pick off the time of arrival of the of the transverse component. In other words, it'll be right here where that bulk comes through. So I have three things I've done. I've picked off the length, the diameter, and this time three observations. Now I can calculate the tension because I know the frequency 
I know the length, and I know the uh, density in the cross-sectional area. And I get a typical value of about five, almost 600 newtons, or about 130 pounds force. From calculating the transverse, uh, the uh, tension, I can calculate the transverse speed, which I showed up above here, around 300, 313 meters per second, ballpark anyway. Now I can also calculate the hammer strike time, because I know what the time of arrival is of the transverse component, and I know these two quantities here, and I can stick those on the graph. Finally, I can estimate when the longitudinal component arrives because I know the hammer strike time and I know the length and I know the speed of the longitudinal component. Now, there's one other time we have to deal with, and that is that early time, this, this part right here, which is in milliseconds, and it's probably associated with the movement of the action when you strike your key with your finger. So for example, you would strike the key with your finger. It would hammer would have to travel about almost two inches to strike the string. And in this case, it's actually 0 0.0445 meters to strike the string. And then it would take about 20, about 22 milliseconds to do that because the nominal speed for an MF type strike, which I think I'm doing, is about two milliseconds per, two meters per, per second. That's coming from the literature. So I'm striking the key, it hammer moves at two, mil, two meters per second, it travels 0 0.445 meters, which can be calculated then to take 22 milliseconds. So we have all these numbers now. Key is struck at time zero, hammer reaches the string approximately 22 milliseconds later, longitudinal component reaches the bridge about 70 microseconds later, after the hammer strike, and then the transverse component reaches the bridge about one millisecond after the hammer strike. Okay, let's go back to the, the uh, pictures. Let's take a look at, put those numbers in this graph. And here they've done that. Here's where the precursor starts. <clears throat> and this number really isn't important because it doesn't appear in any of the equations, but this is where I think it starts. Here's the precursor that I think is associated with the action of the, the movement of the action. Here's where the hammer strikes takes place. Hammer strikes the string. Okay, hammer strikes the string here, the blue line. The red line is 70 microseconds or so later, and that's when the longitudinal component occurs, which is this guy right here. And then the transverse component arrives at this point. And there is the transverse plus the longitudinal component here. Okay, so here's this longitudinal part. Here's the transverse plus the longitudinal or the bulk of the wave. And then over here is this precursor that we are assuming comes from the movement of the action. So that's for the A4 middle string. Now let's do one more string, one more key. I'm going to go over to the Yamaha console and I'm going to look at the F3 middle string. So different piano, different key. And you can see again, there's a precursor, different looking precursor than before. So here's the precursor, here's this background noise, and then right in here, there's a little area just before the bulk of the wave hits, which is probably going to be the longitudinal 
So let's put those numbers in there by picking off these parameters. And we get the beginning of the precursor here, arbitrarily picked that point. Again, that point doesn't enter into the calculations. They come over here. Here's this longitudinal component. Here's the bulk of the wave. And here we can see the hammer strikes the string at this point. The longitudinal component arrives at the bridge at this point. Again, it's a little bit early, so the calculations are a little bit off. Which is not surprising given the fact that the model is, is extremely uh, idealized. Here's this longitudinal component. Here's the transverse component. So, by uh, using these equations that I showed you earlier, we have done, we looked at two keys and we've identified a long component, perhaps related to the action noise after you strike the key with your finger and before the hammer strikes the string. And you get numbers of 19 or well, 20 milliseconds for the Kanabi A4, and you get 42 or so milliseconds for the Yamaha F3. Now this is a, a vertical piano, this is a grand. You also get a short longitudinal component, longitudinal component, 71 milliseconds for the Kanabi A4, and 146 microseconds for the Yamaha console. So we were able to approximately predict these quantities by measuring the string parameters and picking off the transverse wave arrival time. Well, so that completes my discussion of the precursors. Thanks for listening and watching.